uh, we've had a, a very busy week. Uh, we've had uh, three families that have had uh, deaths in the family, and that has affected an awful lot of people. Uh, so please remember those folks, if you would. Uh, don't forget, uh, also, uh, Miss Beckley's sister uh, was in the hospital, and uh, I've got a different bulletin sheet here. Uh, so remember her as well. I think she may be home now, but she's been uh, been quite sick. Uh, and, and Francis uh, wrote and requested prayer for that. So remember that, if you will. Uh, bow your heads, please, as we pray. Father, thank you this morning. Thank you, Lord, that we can gather in your house again. Thank you for your grace and your mercy for watching over us and bringing us here. How glad we are today, Lord Jesus. Uh, that you still love us and care for us. You know every need. You know the need of these families, Lord, that death is robbed. Uh, we thank you for them. Pray that you comfort them and help them in these days. Then, Lord, we pray for these that are sick. Uh, so many needs this morning. And we're so thankful, Lord Jesus, this morning for how you've watched over them. Pray that you would just uh, touch, especially Marianne's brother there this morning in the hospital, and lift him up, encourage their hearts. And then, Lord, this morning, uh, some of our people are still not comfortable coming to church. We understand that. We love them, and we're so thankful, Lord, that they can watch my live stream and for all those others that have joined us week after week. And we're so thankful, Lord, that our church has the outreach that it does locally in the community and on, on, on the live stream. So God bless us all this morning, Lord, and, and strengthen and help us as only you can do on this beautiful day of worship in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Now I should have had you to stand, so I'm going to have you stand now. And we're going to sing this chorus as Jerry comes. And, uh, uh, you know, you're not supposed to be uh, hugging and, and handshaking and all that, but you, as I've been telling you to do, turn around and smile at three people. And, and if you have a mask on or wave at them, you know, that's what they're doing here, folks. And, and uh, just uh, fellowship a little bit, okay? Great. I'm
I've never been through a father. And probably to, to look back at it and try to rummage through something, all the pictures, I know they're young and married, but you know they had pictures there and beautiful things that was there. But then I got to thinking about this. Life, it's, it's the way it is. But if we're ready to go, folks, we've got a home that'll never be destroyed. Amen. We can go into that looking, knowing, and the salvation that will be there eternally. Amen. Ain't you glad of him this morning? Amen. We're going to pray, and I know we've had a lot of sickness, had a lot of requests. And I'm just now learning how to answer them, but that little flip phone. I can hear it just make a little sound like a little wave on there. And I jerk my pocket, go out on one world, but, but it's telling me that maybe it's happening. Larry does a good job getting that out. So we all remember that family, folks. Hold them up. He's gracious, folks, to let us be out. And then we got Mary Ann with a lot of those folks down there. And we want to remember that. We've had deaths here this week. It was sad. Sad to see old Joe go. He had some good times together. We'd gather him in wood and thank Tom sink on us this morning. A lot of this heat that they're saying. But let's just go to him this morning in prayer. And I want you to pray out of your heart because that's exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to thank him for everything that he's ever done for me. He's gracious to me, Larry, to let me even have breath. Lost Bill Teddy this week, too. You want to remember that thing? different ones. We've had a lot of tragedies and things to come up with. So let's remember. Remember our country. Remember how that how that we can know what to do. God just take it to do. It's your world. He got the whole world in his hand, eh? Right. He's got fingers over that way too. You know that. He does us all folks this morning. So let's just pray with him, all right? Father, thank you for the day. Lord, you know, truly from the bottom of our hearts, we're not worthy this morning, Lord, for, for the great gifts and things that you give us. But we're looking to you as an author and a finish for that. We're not going to let our hearts be troubled because we know that you're at the heaven. Lord, you made this whole world and, and in those seven days, Lord, you made everything that moved. And everything that ever will be. You're that kind of a God. And Lord, that when it looked out on the world and it looked like in chaos, it was without form or void. But you stepped out and said, let it. Let it be. Lord, we thank you for that. We're serving one, Lord, at the ancient of days. You've been all around. Lord, you've heard each prayer. You've seen the tears fall this week. You seem like it was the very end. But you was there. You said you'd go with us through it. We may have to go through it. But it's for sure that we don't have to walk alone because you're there. Thank you, Lord. Thank you this morning that we come out together to your house. Lord, we want to leave all the cares outside that door there because you're worthy this morning to be lifted up. Your name, all of heaven, all of heaven, Lord, they praise your name. And Lord, when we get home, we'll be in amongst the thousands and millions of people. Lord, of all kinds, they will be there praising your name. And the Lamb will be in the midst. These are the ones that have overcome. Thank you for that blessed day. Lord, thank you for the day that we said yes to your will. We pray this morning as this service goes out. We will bring a message. Lord, let it sink in on our hearts. Lord, the Sunday school air, the singing, Lord, let it be an uplift to you. Be, Lord, be, pre be pleased with what we do for you. You've made us. Your name is gracious today. We're looking to you now again, Lord, for the remainder of this service and for the rest of our lives, Lord, the longer that we serve you, more precious and more truer, Lord, as we get older. 
Lord, we've talked to the older people in the nursing homes. Lord, we know that their minds slips a lot of times. But Lord, we've always heard, Lord, that you still love them and how they love you. Be with us today. Guide us all through all this next week. Lord, we don't know. We may not even be here next Sunday, Lord. May be in glory with you. But if it is, it's all right. You said the steps of a righteous man was ordered. And Lord, all we've got to do is step. And you're behind us. You're before us. You're on the other side of us. You give us the very food that's on our table. Thank you again. And all of our families. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Are you excited today? Well, you won't know. Go ahead and follow on right here. In the blue. 449. That one we got. Yeah, power in the blue. 449. What do you think about this? Power in the blood. Can you give him a hand like that? Power in the blood. Huh? Power in the blood. Folks, it's higher. It's higher. Thank you, Lord.
Three ninety five. I'm sorry, I'll tell you what. I'm, I'm getting my something wrong with your flash. Three ninety five. Well, that's all right, I need it. Love lifted me. I don't want to be without it. Do you love lifted me? One of your drinks. One song to be always love.
to stand out here for a minute. Uh, we were going to have a baby dedication. One of the wonderful things that pastors love to do. And uh, because of that baby, being the age that she is, what did I do? Here it is. I'm going to put my mask back on as soon as I find it in this pocket. I empty my pockets before the service, actually, uh, because she's so new. I have to hold her kind of close. Uh, but before I do that, I want to share something with you. Many of you, many of you have already heard about uh, Lucas and, and uh, Megan and Macy's house fire this week. Uh, before I say anything else, I want to say to you, what I'm about to say to you is a God thing. And if you don't believe in miracles, we had a real miracle in this family this week. Uh, Megan and Macy were in the bedroom, uh, pretty much asleep. Uh, Lucas works night shift, you know, and, and Lucas came home with the smoke alarm blaring, which Megan vaguely heard in her sleep, Stacy said, and thought it was Lucas's phone alarming because it was time. And, and Lucas came in and found the house on fire in the living room and was able to get Megan and Macy awake and out of the house. Uh, the house is a loss. Uh, most of their things that are a loss, uh, they might salvage a few clothes. Uh, but we would have been uh, lacking the intervention of the Lord in a much different situation this morning than what we are. Because as I said, Lucas works night shift. Most of you know he loves to work on trucks and vehicles. And he, he got off work and was very close, Stacy said, to going and buying parts to work on his truck. But he was so tired, he said, no, I'm just going to go on home. That was a God thing. Because had he not gone home, we potentially, I don't even know if we could have had church today, folks. The, 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 the whole idea of what could have happened is so horrendous, I can't even imagine it. So Megan and Macy are in the nursery. Uh, I, I guess Lucas is asleep. I don't know where Lucas is this morning, but like I said, he's on night shift. And she's trying to get Macy asleep. She can hear me in there. And at the end of the service, she's going to come in and we're going to have a prayer of Thanksgiving before we go home. We are so thankful this morning. Amen. They have a lot of needs. Uh, there's some insurance, but it, it may not cover everything. And and uh, some people have already reached out. Our church will be reaching out as well. Uh, Stacy asked me to, I, I didn't get a chance to confirm this with Megan. Uh, Charlie and Phyllis can say yay or nay here. But Stacy said what they don't need is any more baby clothes. <laughs> That they have more baby clothes right now than they had before the fire. So uh, whatever else you want to do for them uh, directly or through the church is fine. But uh, <coughs> speak to Megan uh, or Lucas or Phyllis or Charlie. They can kind of give you some ideas uh, about what they need. Uh, remember them in prayer and be thankful. God is good. All the time. God is good. Miss, uh, Miss Grandma and Mama, come on up here. Oh, it'll wait. I, I've held them. Uh, it'll be fine. Yeah. Just bring her on. I, I guarantee you there's nothing on that baby that I have not experienced before in 17 years of pediatrics and all this many years of pastoring. Amen. Hmm. Our parenting. Oh, my goodness. Y'all ever seen the movie Three Men and a Baby? Well, yeah. I'm like, I'm like, I think it was Tom Selleck, maybe, or the other guy that was changing that baby. And, and he looked down and he said, I didn't know anything so sweet could make something this bad. <laughs> Amen. Good morning, Mother. You have to tell me that baby's full name, Sylvia. Sylvia Renee Berry Yeah, I thought I knew it was four names. Sylvia, is she asleep? Okay. And Grandpa couldn't be here. He 
he's working. Daddy couldn't be here at the last minute. He's working. So I've got Grandma and Mama. And we're so happy to see this little one here. God bless her. God bless you guys. I have a little reading I want to do for you. How old is she now? A month and six days. She asked me about bringing her to church when she was three or four days old. And I said, okay, I'm going to be like my mentor, Dr. Snyder. No. Don't bring that baby to church yet. Uh, give her a few weeks because uh, of all this sickness that's been around. And now she's a little older and, and uh, growing like a weed. Uh, so they've got her here this morning. Then little children were brought to Jesus for him to place his hands on them and pray for them. But the disciples rebuked those who brought them to Jesus and said, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. In presenting this child for dedication, you signify not only your faith in the Christian religion, but also your desire that she may early know and follow the will of God may live and die a Christian, and may come into everlasting blessedness. In order to attain this holy end, it will be your duty as mom, dad, grandparents, to teach her early the fear of the Lord, to watch over her education, that she be not led astray, to direct her youthful mind to the scriptures and her feet to the sanctuary of God, to restrain her from evil associates and habits, and as much as lies in you to bring her up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Will you endeavor by the help of God to do this? If so, say I will. It's okay, I heard a yes. I'll take a yes. I ask you this congregation then again, will you commit yourself as the body of Christ to support and encourage the parents and grandparents as they endeavor to fulfill their responsibilities to this child and assist Sylvia by nurturing her, her growth towards spiritual maturity. If so, answer, we will. We will. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. We're going to pray. Well, Miss Renee, my turn. She's, she's like on the grandma here. Oh my goodness. Ah, yeah, grunt for me, isn't she gorgeous? Sylvia Renee. Grace Howard. Oh, Sylvia Renee Grace Howard. She's, she's thinking about it. She's got one eye open. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Thank you for your grace and your mercy that you provide us new life. That this little girl has come into the world into the arms of loving parents and grandparents and, and a loving church. This morning, Lord Jesus, we bring her to you in dedication. We ask, Lord, that you would bless her, protect her, strengthen her, help her to grow and find you early in life as Lord and Savior. And may your will in her life be manifest in such a way that all that see her will know that God has had his hand on her. Bless uh, granddad and Dad, this morning as I have to work, keep your hand upon them. And, and may their day be refreshing. May this time, Lord Jesus, refresh the church yeah. that we realize that even in the midst of a pandemic, we are alive and well and that God is still on the throne. Amen. So we dedicate her to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Oh, we're wide awake now. She's got me by the, got me by the wire. <laughs> The Bible says that Jesus is the rose of Sharon. And in the name of Jesus, I baptize you, Sylvia, Marie, Renee Grace Howard. I won't change your name. Amen. That's for your baby book. I'll get the water off of you. Oh, my goodness. Y'all shouldn't have let me have this baby. All right. Give Mama the flower, would you? Normally I say this today. You presented her to me for dedication. I present her back to you in the name of Jesus. Raise her to love and serve the Lord. For his
his glory. Amen. church and I, I went a little long and I apologize for that. I'm going to try to be a little more brief this morning. But I want to say to you, uh, I, I prayed all week that uh, the, the remarks that I made did not discourage anyone or cause anyone to think that the church is in trouble. First of all, the church at Beulah Chapel is alive and well. Amen. And if there's any, any uh, difficulties going on amongst people, I'm not aware of it. Uh, our people love the Lord and love each other. We love the church. We're, we're, we're happy to be Nazarenes and serve the Lord as, as Christian Nazarenes. I'll say it again. I've said it so many times, and you've heard me say it from this pulpit many times. I'm a dyed-in-the-wool Nazarene. I was brought here to this church when I was six weeks old, but I became a Christian at the age of 10, and there's a difference. I understand very thoroughly and clearly the doctrines and polity of our church. Uh, I may not agree with every jot and tittle that people uh, profess uh, about the church, but the church of Jesus Christ in the church of the Nazarene is alive and well. Uh, there are those that would, would preach gloom and doom for our denomination and, and say that we're in, in uh, uh, peril and great difficulty because of the the, the liberal times that we live in. But let me tell you this morning, God has his hand on the church. He raised us up for a purpose and he's going to take care of us all the way home. In, in Matthew chapter 16, uh, some very familiar scripture uh, that Jesus and his disciples uh, are having a, a conversation about uh, who Jesus is this is, this is a very interesting section of scripture to me because uh, you, would, you would not think, of course there's a purpose for everything that Jesus does, you would not think that, that since he is, notice I didn't say if he is, I said since he is the son of God, you would not think that he would need to ask anyone who people say he is or what people think of him. I'm amused at this thing that I see on Facebook where people write this little this little thing, and I think, you just have to forgive me, I think it's the silliest thing I've ever seen. What do you think about me? Now, that's, that's just about the biggest fishing for compliments you could ever make. Because do you think anybody that's your friend is going to get on Facebook and say, you're an idiot. You don't have a brain left. You wouldn't know right from left and up from down. You're two-faced and mean and hateful and angry. It's like people that get on Facebook and say, with, with a picture of themselves and say, how do you think I look? You look like you just climbed out of bed this morning. You look like a troll. You think they're going to say that? No. They're going to say, oh, you look lovely. Oh, and you're the sweetest person on the planet. You've been my friend all my life. I wouldn't take anything for our friendship. Give me a break. The Son of God is asking his disciples in this scripture, who do people say that I am? What do people say about me? And he actually says to them, uh, well, the, the disciples answered, uh, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. And he says to them, but who do you say that I am? Yeah. And Peter, Lord, I love Peter. Peter is, you know, he just, he, he has no filter. He has no reservation. He just is always headlong, both feet out in front, going full steam down the tracks. And he says, well, you're, you, bless, let's see, he says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Amen. And Jesus said, well, Peter, you're blessed because Flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, 
that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he strictly charged the disciples to tell no one that he is or was the Christ. Who am I? You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Now, there are those that would tell us this morning that when Jesus said that to Peter, that meant that the whole Christian church is going to be on Peter because the word Peter, Petros, means the rock. And, and that's not what Jesus is saying. Jesus is saying that on this apostolic confession of faith, of who I am, the Christ, the Son of the living God, on that I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. That's right. You say, well, there are those in the Christian church. We, we know of other denominations that have suffered greatly under liberalism. They still suffer today under it. It's split denominations. It has ruined churches in many places because of the stand that they're taking on the liberal side of things. But let me tell you this morning, Jesus Christ is going to build his church. It's not my church. It's not your church. It's his church. We are the church. We have a beautiful building here. Uh, it, it's, it's paid for. We have a lot of space. We're not able to use it all right now. But this is not the church. This is the church house. When I was a boy, they used to call the church the church house. We're going down to the church house. We need to go clean the church house. We need to work at the church house. We need to do this or that at the church house. But who did that? The church. Those Christians and people who love God, love the church, love the kingdom, would show up here on work days and donate their time, and, and do the work that needed to be done. And, and that's why I say to you, the church is alive and well. Everybody is interested in building the church. I, uh, I have not always appreciated, uh, I have to be really careful here because this is on Facebook, and it's live. And it can be watched for years to come, maybe. I have not always appreciated the church growth movement in starting new churches, starting new churches. We gotta start new churches. Everything becomes about starting new churches. Of course we need to start new churches. That's how we grow. Three little women in Chattanooga first had a burden a hundred years ago yeah. to start a holiness Nazarene church in this community in 1918. They came up here in T models and A models on roads that didn't exist hardly with ruts and holes. And they brought a Brush Harbor meeting over here and started this church. So I'm all about starting new churches, but I am not about starting new churches at the sacrifice of missions and every other ministry in the denomination, be it ours or anybody else's. Jesus will build the church. And he will lay on the hearts of people the, the burden to start new churches. We're all about building the church. Oh, and then, of course, when you talk about building the church, well, how many did you average last year? Mm -hmm. how, many did you, how many did you have in Sunday school? How many did you have in worship service? How many did you have on Sunday night? And how many did you have on Wednesday night? And how, many, how much money did you raise last year in total? And how much did you give away? And how much do you have left? Did you know they ask us all those questions? Oh yeah, Charlie and me are all about getting those numbers right, Dan and, and Gene and, and the church board. We have, we have to be careful with all that stuff. So the N word comes up, the number word. The best thing could happen in, in any church is get the number board off the wall Amen. and quit looking at it. And then go out and invite your neighbors and friends and you'll know when they come. Amen. Amen. And if they're not
not coming. Look at your invitation scheme. Mm. Maybe you need to take them a, a, a mess of tomatoes or okra this summer and invite them to church. Mm. Jerry's under conviction already over there over Sunday. It's been many years now, since about 1965, when the numbers started to go down. Baby boomers. That's about the time that it started to decline. Our culture has changed. I mentioned that last week. My goodness, how the world has changed. But the Bible is very clear. There is no shadow of turning in me, God said. Amen. Do you know that means a whole lot more and if Bill Dawson said, there is no shadow of turning in God. Because, you know, ultimately, I can say anything I want to about God. I mean, think about that. I can. But when God himself, I am, the great I am, who always was and always will be, says, there is no shadow of turning in me. I change not. What that means is, the words of Jesus are true. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. There are those who come forward with all kinds of answers, like I mentioned last week. I get all these wonderful things uh, in the email and, and on Facebook, and I, uh, it comes from all directions, in the mail, about how to build your church and what you're doing wrong and what you need to do right. We've tried some of that here. It didn't work very well. Uh, we've had people here who told us recently, just the last short years, what we were doing wrong and what we needed to change it. And I just looked at them and I said, I'm sorry to tell you that, friend. It just won't work here. I know my people. I know this church. I've been here off and on all my life. Some things will work here, some won't. For example, don't take the offering in the middle of the service. And actually, some of you expressed to me that you'd prefer not to take the offering in the middle of the service because it kind of is a, is, is a distraction to you. Well, bless God, here we are having to take the offering at the end of the service because of COVID. We don't want to handle the offering plates. We don't want everybody handling the offering plate and passing it on, you know. So here we are doing exactly what was suggested, but for a very different reason. The rock. You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. The rock then is that confession on which Jesus will build the church. Peter did not begin to understand or fully grasp or comprehend what Jesus was saying to him at that moment. They're still thinking, the disciples are still thinking, a, a glorious king, a kingdom, and we'll be part of it. Jesus is going to have a kingdom. He's going to be the king of the Jews, and we'll be part of it. That's not what Jesus is thinking about. Jesus is thinking about a crucified Savior that is going to and must go to a cross to die and shed his blood for our sins, to be put in a tomb and resurrected on the third day and eventually taken back to heaven and sit at the right hand of the Father. The Bible says making intercession for us so that when we mess up, he's right there to defend us and help us. Thank God for a God of grace and mercy. Amen. Did you mess up anywhere this week? You don't have to raise your hand. <laughs> I got tickled with Gene Tilly. I forgot what it was exactly Gene Tilly said yesterday downstairs when we were preparing the food and stuff. And I looked at him and I said, all right, Gene, here we go. Just as I am, the altar's open. Did you need to talk to the Lord about anything this week where you messed up? Well, that attorney called Jesus Christ, that advocate of the, uh, uh, for us at the right hand of the Father is there in grace and mercy, ready to plead our case and help us. Peter couldn't have comprehended that. And then Peter pops up again when Jesus talks about uh, being crucified and going to the cross. He says, mm -mm, no way. It's not going to happen to you. And what does Jesus say to Peter? After he just told Peter, you are the rock. And on this rock, I will build my church. Jesus turns right around to Peter and says, get thee behind me, Satan. Well, which is it? Is Peter going to be the rock 
Or is he representing Satan at that moment? Mm. Don't you love the Bible? You know, God has a sense of humor, the way he tells us these stories. Get thee behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. Why? Because Peter is not yet sanctified and filled with the Spirit from the day of Pentecost. So that what it so so that is what it takes for Jesus to do the Christ job that he came to do. He has to go to a cross. And you say, oh, you've done messed up. You've done, you, 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 not done. That's bad grammar. You've already let Jerry lead singing and sing those old songs. Hmm. And then you let him pray instead of letting the pastor pray. Well, I, there's a reason for that. I felt impressed to let him pray this morning. And, and then you, you, you talked about the old days and the holiness revival and bringing the church to this community. We don't want to hear about that old stuff. And now you've mentioned the cross. That's a downer. That's discouraging. Let's see. I wish I knew his name. Let me find his name. That, that, don't talk about the cross. Don't talk about that old stuff. Uh, don't, don't, uh, don't mention sacrifice or dedication or, or uh, any of those things that, that kind of make us want to feel depressed and down. We want, to, we want to sing the same chorus 33 times and then make one more round and sing it six more. I'm on, I'm, I'm, if I'm not on your toes, I'm on somebody's toes this morning, right there, and I'll take it. We want to sing these, uh, these new ditties. You know, we lost Dr. Cunningham this week. Dr. Paul Cunningham is one of the most godly men I have ever had the privilege to work with. I loaded him in a car and hauled him all over Haiti for two full weeks. I got to sit in the car every day and talk in fellowship with Paul Cunningham, wonderful pastor, general superintendent, went home to glory this week. Dr. Cunningham and I were talking one day and, and, and we were talking about the growth of the church around the world. And uh, he, was, he was a very quiet spoken man in that setting. He's the man that I've quoted to you before that said, it's a good thing the church is growing fast overseas, brother. They'll save us from ourselves. They will, if we listen to them. They will. You've talked about the cross. You shouldn't have brought that up. That's, that's a downer. Well, let me tell you this guy's name. Some of you will know it as soon as I say it. George Bernard, 1913, wrote these words. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The emblem of suffering and shame. And I love that old cross where the dearest and the best for a world of lost sinners were slain. Do you know what the modern people tell us? You shouldn't be singing that song. It's not scriptural. That's idolatry. We don't worship the cross. No, but we worship the one who hung on the cross. And I'm proud to say that. And in the course of that song, oh, we love it. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross not because it's a cross, not because of it's a crucifix or a necklace or a bracelet, but because it was an altar on which the Lamb of God was sacrificed for one time for the sins of the world. And it will never have to happen again. Amen. I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross. Why? Because of what it stands for and exchange it someday for a crown. Amen. If you don't get anything else, listen to me carefully. When you get rid of the cross, you're getting rid of the blood. When you get rid of the altars, you're getting rid of a place 
for people to meet God one-on-one. -on -one. When you get rid of the hymnal, you no longer are able to hold 700 and some odd pages of words and music that are based on the truth of this book. Be careful. Be careful what you get rid of, what you take away. Oh, I'm not unchristianizing anybody that likes to sing courses. That's fine. We enjoy singing courses around here too. Jerry sang this little line of mine, fit right in with my message last Sunday. When he started to sing it, I thought, I'm going to skin him. And then I thought, that's really good. That's going right along with what I want to talk about this morning. God has a plan, folks. I will build my church on this rock. I will build my church. He will build it. It won't be programs. It won't be uh, fancy, fancy light shows and laser shows like I talked about last week. It won't be painting the walls of the sanctuary black or the ceiling black so the lights show up better. It won't be a praise team that becomes a star magnet where people are become prima donnas in the church and I'm the singer and I'm the leader. God help us that that never happens. Jesus said something else very important to Peter. It's really important. He says, on this rock I will build my church. The gates of hell will not prevail against it. And, don't you love the and? That means there's more coming. And it's good. I will give to you the keys of the kingdom. And whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. It appears that Peter held the keys on Pentecost when thousands came to Jesus at the preaching of the first Pentecostal gospel message. Thousands came to him. In fact, if you look at the numbers and you extrapolate them out with men and women and boys and girls by the ninth chapter of the book of Acts, there's maybe 15 to 20,000 Christians now because of the giving of the Holy Spirit at Pentecost. The apostles continued in their doctrine, the Bible says, and were steadfast. And the church grew and grew. I'm going to be a paraphraser this morning. And grew and grew and grew. And one day, it made its way to this community. And we heard the message of holiness of heart and deliver it, full deliverance from sin and full pardon and joy and gladness in serving him who is the King of kings and Lord of lords. Thank God for the church. Thank God for, thank God for Peter. If Peter hadn't spoken up and said what he did, Jesus might not have spoken those words that day. Could have been a different scenario. So some worry about the church. It's a little bit natural. Sometimes things have popped their heads up and I've gone to Martha and in her own special way. She basically says, it's all right. The Lord will take care of it. We'll cross the bridge when we get to it. Can I say to you this morning, don't worry about the church. God's still on the throne. He's still watching over us. He still has his hand on us. We're a small crowd compared to normal today, but there's more of us than there were last week, and I pray there'll be more of us next week. Yeah. And the week, and the year, and the decade, and the century after, if Jesus tarries, He'll be there, He'll be there with us. He knows what we need. Some have asked me, are you worried about the church? No. Nope. Are you worried about the money? No, nope. I look at the money. I look at the reports. I can, I can look in the treasurer's book and see how much money's in the bank. I, 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 I know that we can't go out and, well, we did, didn't we? We went out and spent $50,000 across the road that we didn't have. And the men and women of the church that volunteered and worked over there gave us another 50 in labor and machines and 
dedication, maybe more than more than another 50. Do you worry about the church? No, I don't. I don't worry about the light bill. We can, we can, we can worship in the daytime and leave the lights off if we have to. Amen. Good night. Wake up. <laughs> you don't want to turn that air conditioner off, though, are you? <laughs> Amen. There's been a great falling away. There's a lot of hard hearts. There's a lot of people that love themselves more than they love God. He will build his church. Thank God. Aren't you glad? Um, Jamie, come to that piano, would you? We've got to sing a song before we go home. I'm going to let you out early. I held you too long last week. I apologize for that. But uh, there's, a, there's a wonderful song. It's one of Elizabeth Ingram's favorite songs. She always asks me to sing it now and then. And we're going to sing it this morning in closing. Uh, as soon as I find the right, right title here. Um, I got it. Just hang on. Just hang on. You may, you may have to come up here and help me, Jerry, because I'm pretty hoarse. Um, well, Jerry, help me. Tis a glorious church. What's the name of that? Well, I looked at that. I didn't see it. I think it's a glorious church, isn't it? Why, yes, it is. 672. It's not going to be on the screen. You'll have to pick up a real book. Unless you know the words. Come on up here, Jerry.
just kind of make me remind me we don't have any special prayer, but thanks now uh, as Randy prays for us and for Megan and uh, Macy. Are they still in the nursery, Charlie? Yes. Is Megan still in the nursery? Yes, Megan's still in the nursery. There she is. Well, did you get her doing? Megan and Macy. Megan's kin to her sister, Samantha. They like to go barefoot. Come here, girl. We, we want to look at you in this day. We look to you to be loved on you, too, because you guys are walking here. Larry's going to pray. I made some. Are we thankful? Yeah. <laughs> 